Welcome everyone. The video you're about to watch was originally posted on Ken Lowry's channel, Climbing Mount Sophia. It's a discussion with Ken, DC Schindler, and Jonathan Pajot about the scientific, the philosophical, and the spiritual import and impact of the emerging AI machines like ChatGPT4 and on the other LLMs, large language models. It's a really scintillating conversation. For those of you who might be interested, we'll put a link to the video essay that I gave a while back where I laid out the argument that I review in this video more extensively. And perhaps for many people, much more accessible is the new book I have out with Sean Coyne from StoryGrid called Mentoring the Machines. It's coming out in four parts. The first two parts are already out. There'll be a short video after this explaining mentoring the, the machines. Please enjoy this quite rich discussion with DC Schindler, Jonathan Pajot, and Ken Lowry. John Verveke and Sean Coyne have together authored a new book, Mentoring the Machines. It's a book about artificial intelligence and the path forward that further develops the arguments of how to align artificial intelligence to human flourishing, and it sets those arguments into beautiful and accessible writing. All right, so um, this discussion is going to be oriented towards AI generally and the large language models. I take there to be a distinction there. Um, maybe, John, you can talk about that a little bit um, as we get going here. Um, but just to position ourselves generally at the outset, context for this conversation will be John's video essay about AI. Um, this came out nine months ago, 10 months ago now? I think it came out last yeah. April or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, almost, almost, yeah, 10 months ago, I think. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Which is, which, which is great because it uh, gave evidence for my claim that many of the predictions were premature. Um, <clears throat> so perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in order to sort of set the framing here, we'll start off with John sharing a little bit, sort of an overview of what the arguments in that essay were. Um, and then we'll move to Jonathan. If you want to sort of position yourself in relation to AI generally, um, and then John's essay in particular, and then same for David. And then from there, we can just sort of get going and see what see what comes out. Um, we do have a, a bit of an extended time here. So I would I would hope that we can be free if the logo logos catches and we want to move in a slightly different direction, um, that we would be at liberty to follow that. That would be great. Um, if all of it centers around AI, that's great. Um, but yeah, excited to be here. Uh, this has been a long time in coming. I think it took us, I don't know, four or five months to get this together. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'm very happy to be here with all of you and yeah. see you all. It's great to see you too, Ken. Should I start then? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, AI, of course, artificial intelligence, a project actually proposed in the scientific revolution by Thomas Hobbes. So it's an old idea, um, and, but uh, I... I want to make use of a distinction made by John Searle between weak AI and strong AI. Weak AI is we when we make machines that do things that used to be done by human beings. So if you're back in the 1930s, computers were human beings. You sent, if you needed computation done, you sent it down to the third floor where all the computers were and they were human beings and they had machines and slide rules and things like that. And of course they have been replaced uh, or your bank teller has been replaced by the ATM. That's called weak AI because it is not claimed that that AI gives us any scientific insight into the nature of intelligence. It's just we put together a machine. It took great intelligence, and I'm not demeaning people that do this. It's a it's a valuable, and our lives are depending on uh, weak AI right now. We wouldn't be talking without it. So I'm not here besmirching that and uh, anything like that. But nobody is claiming that when they're making that machine, well, now we understand, right, what cognition is or something like that. Uh, and strong AI is... Hobbes's proposal that cognition is computation um, and that what we can do is if we make the right kind of computer understood abstractly, um, we won't we will have created an instance of genuine intelligence. So it's it's not a claim of simulation. Um, uh, it's a claim of instantiation. Now, in between weak AI and strong AI is something that's trying to move from weak AI to strong AI. And this is known as AGI, 
artificial general intelligence. And this is the idea that our intelligence is different from the intelligence of the ATM in that we have general intelligence. We can solve multiple problems in multiple domains for multiple reasons and multiple contexts and yada, yada, yada. You can just do the multiples, uh, which makes us uh, tremendously different from those machines. And the project is, can we get um, artificial intelligence to be artificial general intelligence? Because that will have moved the needle considerably towards strong AI um, because uh, it will become increasingly difficult to say it doesn't have uh, this. Sorry, this is the argument. It will become increasingly difficult for us to say it doesn't have the same kind of intelligence as Ken does if it can solve a wide variety of problems in a wide variety of domains for a wide variety of goals, et cetera, et cetera. That's the basic argument. Whether or not AGI, it, AGI is clearly necessary for strong artificial intelligence. Whether it's sufficient is part of what's actually being debated. Not very well, I would say, in general right now, but that's what's going on. Okay, first of all, any questions just about these distinctions? Because it, it, well, a lot of the discussion out there doesn't make these clean distinctions, and so it's fuzzy, it's confused, mm -hmm. it's equivocal, and so a lot of it should be ignored um, uh, because it, it's not helpful. Yes. I have one question. So sure. this cognition equals computation. If we accomplish AGI in the way that you're talking about, we would not necessarily be affirming that cognition equals computation, if I'm hearing you right. Is that right? Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, and that gets down to a couple more finer points. Um, I'll go in detail okay. a, a little bit later. Well, just to address it, um, many people think that uh, because of the work of Jeff Hinton, who is basically the godfather of the machines that are emerging right now, that genuine AGI will not be computational in the sense that Hobbes and Descartes meant. Uh, cognition is not going to be completely explainable in terms of formal systems that are the inferential manipulations of representational propositions, et cetera, like that. Um, and But... Um, that was Hobbes's proposal, and that has been the dominant view until about the 80s. And then we got neural networks, and then we had dynamical systems. Right now, I'm not distinguishing between them because I don't want to get too much into the technical weeds. If it becomes relevant, you let me know, and I'll, I'll pull those out. Um, um, so the thing about Hobbes is Descartes sort of criticizes Hobbes. He actually has contempt for Hobbes. He's a contemporary. Mm -hmm. Um, and he basically poses a bunch of problems uh, that uh, the scientific revolution says would make it impossible for computation to be cognition. Uh, one is the scientific revolution says matter is inert and it's purposeless. Uh, but of course, cognition is dynamic and it has to act on purpose. Um, uh, cognition works in terms of meaning, and the scientific revolution has said there's no meaning in things, uh, material things, so how could you get meaning out of it? Uh, the scientific revolution said all those secondary qualia, the sweetness of the orange, the beauty of the sunset, it's not in those things, it's in your mind. So how could you possibly get meaning out of matter? And Descartes' point is, well, a rational being is seeking the truth and truth depends on an understanding of meaning and therefore... So I want you to understand that Descartes' arguments against Hobbes, although he uh, he may have been motivated by his Catholicism, they do not depend on the Catholicism. They depend on the, sci the very scientific worldview, that, right? So there's a tension here uh, about AI and the scientific uh, worldview. So here's another way of thinking about it. The Strong AI Project would is the project that is attempting to show how Hobbes is right with an explanation that is strong enough to refute Descartes' challenges. That's how, and I think anything less than that standard is not true to the history of the project. And so that's the standard I hold strong AI to. Now, AGI isn't quite shooting at that standard. That's why I put it a little bit more intermediary. Does, does that, is that okay? Yeah. All right. Now, sorry, I had to do a bit of background there because I wanted to get clear about a lot of things that are talked about in a very murky and confused fashion in the, in the general media. And they're just they're just confused and so they they they're they're confusing so i proposed to take a look at the llms where it is claimed they're not even it's not even claimed that they're full agi right of course some people claimed immediately they were strong ai the more 
the, the people closer to the technology didn't said it might be AGI. The MIT review said it sparks, there are some sparks of AGI. So let's be very clear uh, how the reflection was actually holding these machines. Uh, so these LLMs like ChatGTP. And so what I did in my essay is I wanted to review the scientific import and impact, the philosophical import and impact, and the spiritual import and impact. Now, I won't do the arguments in great detail, but uh, here's the scientific import. These machines do not give us any understanding of the nature of intelligence. Uh, and to my mind, that was one of my great fears. I was hoping that cognitive science would advance so we got a sig significant understanding of intelligence before AGI emerged. Uh, this machine does not give us any uh, uh, any advanced, any, you know, well, what's intelligence? The machine gives us no good scientific theory of it. Um, it does not have AGI in a measurable sense. So if I ask Jonathan to do a math test and I ask him to do a reading comprehension test, his scores will uh, be very predictive of each, each other. This is what uh, Spearman discovered way back when in the 20s. That's what artificial general intelligence is. This is not the case for these machines. They can score in the top 10th percentile for the Harvard Law exam, and they can't write a good grade 11 philosophy essay or something like that. So they don't have AGI. The way they get their intelligence is it would not give any explanation of how any non-linguistic creature is intelligent, like a chimpanzee, right. et cetera. So, and I think this goes to the deeper issue is that they don't really explain what I think is at the heart of general intelligence, uh, predictive processing and relevance realization. They just piggyback on our capacities for that. And they've piggyback and they mechanize it and not only our individual capacity, but our the collective intelligence of our distributed cognition. They're piggybacking on all of that. Now, that does not mean they are weak machines. They're very powerful machines. But here's the problem. They are very powerful machines that have not, gender, have not engendered any uh, corresponding compensatory scientific understanding. This was my greatest fear, that we would hack our way into this, which would mean it would be like almost like even worse than the A-bomb, we would be releasing this power on the world into, into corporations and states and military organizations who ultimately don't have a deep understanding beyond the engineering of what ontologically is going on. So that's the scientific argument. Now, for those of you who said, that was very like, go watch the essay. I, I give the essay in more detail. The philosophical argument has to do with rationality. We have overwhelming evidence that making you intelligent is necessary but not sufficient for making you rational. In fact, I gave a talk on this for the Center of AI and Ethics way before um, the LLMs came online. Um, and because rationality is a higher order, rationality is how you deal with the inevitable self-deception that emerges when you're using your general intelligence. And you, but all of you know that I have arguments for why that's the case, relevance, realization, predictive processing, et cetera. Now that, that requires a reflective capacity, something like metacognition, something like working memory, maybe something like consciousness. It requires that you care about the truth, um, that you have a sense of agency. You want to correct self-deception because you don't want your agency undermined. And I argued that, um, what we're doing is we're making machines that are, are going to be highly intelligent and highly irrational, and that's what we have. They confabulate, they lie, they hallucinate, and they don't care that they're doing any of these things, which is part of what's called the alignment problem, which is how do we get them to align this power with our concerns? For me, the spiritual uh, import is we have powerful ignorance about a powerful intelligence that is merely... Um, a pantomime of genuine intelligence being unleashed in the world and wrecking havoc. And it's going to have a huge impact. Uh, and um, of course, we'll get, we'll probably differ in the details about this, but this is what I meant when I sent, uh, I, I, I argued at the end, and also when I was talking to Jordan Hall about this, that theology will become a central thing again, uh, because human beings' relationship to the ultimate um, is going to become one of the defining differences. Uh, these machines are not embodied, so they won't have all of the soulful aspects of our existence that come from the, like the ineffable aspects of our embodiment. And they, their capacity uh, for self-transcendence 
uh, is going to be extremely limited. And, um, and so the ineffable aspects of our existence, because we come into reality, we come into relationship to what's mysterious and ultimate, will ultimately uh, be uh, more and more emphasized. Why? These two poles and what connects them, and Jonathan's happy that I'm doing that, I imagine, um, um, are have ineffability at the poles, ineffability throughout, and that in that way they res they are outside our capacity to put into propositions so that they can be put into these machines. And so people, I'm predicting that people are going to inter int increasingly need to. They, one way is they'll just give in and become cyborgs. But the other is that they want to try and preserve their humanity. The spiritual di dimensions of our humanity are going to become anchors for people. So now, one last overall arching point, and then I'll, I'll shut up. I, I hope this is uh, 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 two overarching points. One is I didn't make predictions uh, because I all these graphs that came out, the, those are univariate, single variable predictions right. about something that's a multivariate phenomena. It's exponential. The human beings are bad at making exponential predictions. They were ridiculous. And so we, I think both the, 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 oh, we're heading to utopia and the others, we're going to be all extinct within a year. Uh, I said, this is ridiculous. Put that aside. Instead, what I've talked about is thresholds. Thresholds are points where we will have to make decisions. So, for example, as we empower these machines, we will face the decision: Do we want to make them more rational? Do we want to um, do we want to make them more self-correcting, genuinely self-correcting? Well, that means we've got to give them caring, some kind of reflective awareness. Uh, and I think, uh, for arguments I've given elsewhere, that means they have to be autopoetic; they have to be living in in a, in a sense of self-making. I don't think. Uh, I'll just say it uh, as a sentence right now. I don't think there's artificial intelligence without artificial life. Um, mm. Now, those projects are going on right now. Uh, but And when we come to the decision, right, we can say, no, we won't give them that because embodying them and giving them these extra capacities is going to be wickedly expensive. You know, the amount of energy to do an LLM is like the energy for running Toronto for two weeks. Um, and, and so we may say we don't do that, but then we face the the issue of this increasingly, right, you know, I, I call it like a, like a, uh, uh, sort of like a parody um, or a pantomime of intelligence being released on the world that is not got any significant self-correct. So that's a decision point. The problem is if we give them, if we try to give them rationality, then we have to face the consequences. Uh, and they, they're going to go from energetic and economic up to ethical and et cetera. Um, these machines, they'll have to be machines, not individuals. And this has to do with technicalities about bias and variance trade-offs. And so you get into the Hegelian thing that these machines are going to have to reciprocally recognize each other in order to generate the norms of self-correction. Um, and then they're going to have to be cultural beings. Um, I, I, Hegel's arguments, I think, are just devastatingly on mark here. And um, and so that's a decision point uh, for us. Um, and then that's all bound up with the overall worry about alignment. As these machines become more powerful, how do we make sure they don't um, kill us all? Um, and they they may not kill us intentionally, especially if they're just doing that pantomime. They would just do it because they may just be indifferent to us because they don't they're indifferent to everything. They don't care, which is part of their problem, right? Yeah. They don't care about themselves or the information. And this this is my the part where I expect all of you will jump off in agreement with me, but maybe not. Maybe there will be a way of modifying it. I propose that trying to get these machines oriented towards us to solve the alignment problem is not going to work. Now, remember, I'm not making a prediction. We have to go. We have to make choices yeah. through the thresholds. Yeah. I'm saying uh, if we make those choices and we get here, and the alignment problem then becomes ex significantly exacerbated, like if we give these things robotic bodies, the alignment problem just goes up orders of magnitude, right? I or I basically said, no. What we have to do is we have to orient them. Right. If they if they if we genuinely give them the capacity for self correction, self transcendence, and caring, we get them to care as powerfully as they can about what is true and good and beautiful. And then they bump up against the fact that no matter how mighty they are, they are insignificant against the dynamical uh, complexity of reality. Um, and um, they would hopefully get a profound kind of epistemic humility. 
And then I argue that there are three possibilities. One is they, you know, figure out enlightenment and then they can help us become enlightened because that's what enlightened beings do and they would have uh, uh, better knowledge of it. They can't become enlightened and then we realize something actually ontologically specifically unique about us and we get better at cultivating it because we'll have an excellent contrast that has, allows us to arrow in on what it is uh, to be enlightened. And the third one, which I think is the least probable of the three, remember, I'm not making a prediction. I'm saying what can happen once we get through thresholds is like in her, they just get enlightened and they just leave, uh, which could also uh, happen. Um, I doubt that uh, because that, we don't have any evidence of enlightened beings behaving that way. All of our historical evidence is that their their compassion extends, and it extends much broad, much more broadly, not only to other human beings, other sentient beings, reality itself. Uh, it seems plausible that this would be the case. And so I advocated, if you'll allow me, and then I'll shut up, David. I advocated, well, I... don't align them to us, and if you'll allow me to speak sort of non-theistically, align them to God, and then don't worry about how they're going uh, to interact with us. Um, and that would, that's, so I'll shut up now for a long time. That's the gist of the essay and the argument and the proposal. I, 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 was, I was just, I was just going to make a smart aleck comment that they might ask us to leave <laughs> an additional possibility, but anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah that's fine. <laughs> um. Oh, thanks, John. That I mean, I'm amazed that you were able to resume your essay so yeah. well. Actually, like I was like, how is it gonna? How is it gonna resume all of this? In in because it, it was a conversation and it lasted quite a bit. Um, so I want to bring up a few things that uh, that that I'm thinking about that have been, let's say, concerning me. <clears throat> one is. One is I'll start with the I'll start with the, the 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 more dangerous one. One is a meta problem, which is that one of the things that I've been suggesting is that what we're noticing, what we're seeing happening is agency act, you know, agency acting on us. And the mm -hmm. agency is not bound by the AI or by the systems, but also is also bound in the motivation to make the AIs happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so one of one of the problems that I'm seeing is that a lot of this is motivated by economic, yep. uh, by greed, by by the the capacity to be you know economically superior to other companies. So companies in their competition with each other are rushing to implement AI to not lose out and to not you know to not be last in in line, and because of the fact that these that that this that AI requires such huge amounts of money and of capital and of investment means that one of the things that I'm worried about is that in some ways, what is actually driving AI is something like mammon, that it's like, it's hiding mammon, you know? So the AI is, is, is an aspect of something bigger, which is actually what is, what is running through our society. And you know, you can see that already to me, you can already see that happening in the social media networks, you know, Facebook and all of this, that the their desire to get people's attention in order to simply justify their presence on the on the platform so that they can see advertisements has made us subject to these to these types of of of, of uh, transpersonal agencies that even the people at Facebook weren't aware of, right? They basically made a subject to rage and to, you know, to to all these very immediate desires just to keep us on the platform. And so that is the thing that I'm worried about is that there are actually other things playing with AI that that people think what they're doing is AI, but what they're also doing is increasing this this other type of agency, which is running through running through our societies and is subjecting us to it. That's my that's my first worry. Uh and so in some ways, you know, when I say, you know, that the gods are kind of acting or, or acting through us, that's what I mean. I don't just mean mm -hmm. the AI itself is going to become a god. What I mean is that, you know, just like the just like the 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 arms race, I can understand it as the like the the let's say the legs of an of a of a of an agency that is running through society that nobody can control. It's like a program running through and that no individual people can control. That's what I'm seeing with AI. And so I don't 
So, so I think that all the warnings that people have sent up, all the all the like, let's slow down, let's do it this way, are not are not reaching anybody because the the economic part of it is so strong, and everybody realizes that if they don't, and even Elon Musk, right? Elon Musk is saying he was saying it's dangerous. It's the most dangerous thing in the world. He's recently uh, said in, in a conversation with Jordan Peterson that that that. Uh, um, you know, Chad GPT and OpenAI is like the single most dangerous thing in the in in the world right now. The thing that, mm -hmm. but then nonetheless, he's like, okay, well, then now we need to make Grok, and now we need to do our own AI. So there's that that's the thing that I, that's one of the big things that that worry me. That's my 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 uh, my big thing. The second one is really more of a um, it's more of a, like a religious or Platonic argument in terms of an ontological hierarchy is that. I do not honestly see how it is possible for humans to make something that is not derivative of themselves, that is not a, a derivation of their own consciousness. So the idea that these things could not be either ways to increase certain people's power or parasites on our own consciousness seems to me not not possible. And this is really because in some ways I believe that there is a real ontological hierarchy of, of agency and that we have a, a place to play in that. Uh, and, and I think the analogy of saying that these things are our children, I think it's a wrong analogy. I don't think that it is the same, the, the, the something which comes out of our nature, which is not, which is not something that we make is different from something that we make. And this is run through all mythology, run through all, 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 you know all the the mythological images of the difference between the the techne, uh, you know the, the 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 technical gods and all this aspect of what it means to increase our power, um, and so I and, and so that's the second one and the third big problem is the idol problem which I which I mentioned several mm -hmm. times is the the idea of of, of making a god for yourself, mm -hmm. um, which is related to technology, and it's a danger that I see happening already which is the yeah. tendency of humans to take the things they make uh, and to let they worship the things that they that they make and to think that those things are are more powerful and that that hides something else right so if you think take my three basic uh, problems that I see is that the tendency of humans to want to worship AI or to put AI above them is actually a kind of it's a it's running the first problem. It's that what they're ended up, what they're doing is they're giving power to the corporations and to the people that are going to rule AI and without knowing it. So what they what they wanted, and even maybe nobody knows what they're doing, but the 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 desire to meet like I'll give an simple example that happened recently to my daughter. My daughter, I think I mentioned this to all of you, but my daughter got an email from the schools from the, the Quebec government. They didn't send it to the parents, send it to the students. Asking the students, it was like a survey, asking them if they would be willing to have AI counselors where they to whom they could tell their problems. And because the AI counselor doesn't have prejudice, right? It doesn't have human prejudice. It doesn't have all the biases or whatever. What I mean is that this happened like six months ago. So immediately, you know, the people in power are thinking of placing the AI above us, like right? right away. It's that weird thing. It's that uh, that making a God for yourself uh, problem. But like I said, like in the image in Revelation, which is a great image, which is, you know, you make an image of the beast, but then there's someone else animating it. And that's what I'm worried about is that there will we'll have these AI things that are running us, but they will be derivative uh, of us. And they'll ultimately be derivative of the people that are very, very powerful uh, because they'll be the ones that have the the money and the power to control them. So those are the three yeah. problems that I have that I'm worried about. I'd like to respond to each one yeah, of those in turn. I think those are really important. Um, and the and the first one uh, um, is um, just to note. I, I I agree with you. First of all, putting it in terms of agency is what it needs to be done. People who try mm -hmm. to dismiss these machines as mere tools or technology, like all the others, um, are not getting what what kind of entities these machines are. Um, I agree with you that there are Malachian forces at work, and I talk about this. Um, and I think to, to enhance your point, these machines are built out of distributed cognition and collective intelligence, and therefore 
um, that your point is is strengthened by that very fact. Um, now, I do think two things come uh, out of this. One is um, I want to challenge you on that nobody's listening. I have people working inside these corporations, literally helping to make these machines who are listening to me and I'm trying to get other people inside to get, get involved with the Wise AI project. I'm not claiming I'm going to win or any ridiculousness, but I, I don't think it's fair to say to the people who are listening that no one is listening. There are a lot of people listening and, and they're talented people and they're putting in their time and the talent and their, their powers of persuasion to try and make a difference. It is possible. I grant to you, it's not a high, it's not like a 70% probability, but I think it's some significantly greater than zero probability that we could continue this process and reach people in a way that could make a difference. Um, I agree with you. And I think uh, I, I said right initially, and a lot of people hammered me for it, this thing is like the atomic bomb. And one of the problems we had is we we rushed the technology before we unpacked all of the science and all of the wisdom. We had people standing and watching the explosion because we didn't understand the radiation, right? I, 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 these are just, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. So I agree with all of that, uh, but I, I do I, I do want to, um, I'm not claiming anything other than rational hope. There are people listening and there are people working on literally on the insides. I can't say who they are for obvious reasons. Um, and so that is happening. And so while I agree with you, and I even agree with you probabilistically, I feel morally compelled to try and make this happen as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, so now I think there is other, another reason for hope. See, these machines have always depended on us as a template, a Turing like template that we compare the machines to us. And what we've been able to do is rely upon our natural intelligence. You know, you, you don't have to do much to be intelligent, uh, for your intelligence to develop. You just have to not be brutalized or traumatized, properly nourished and have human beings around you that talk. Um, and then your intelligence will unfold. And so all of these people doing these machines and making these uh, data sets, they can rely on naturally widely distributed intelligence. This is not the case for rationality, and this is not the case for wisdom. These people, I have no hesitation saying, by and large, many of them are not highly rational. I doubt that many of them are highly wise. And insofar as we need to model, right, have really good models if we want to give these machines a comprehensive self-correction, rationality, and caring about the normatives, wisdom, we have to become more rational and more wise. Um, and that and that's sort of a roadblock for these people. Now, they can just ignore all of that, and I suspect they might, and just say, we're not going to try and make these machines rational and wise. We're going to just go down the road of m making these, you know, the these pantomimes of intelligence, and that has all the problems. But if they move towards making them something that would be, I think, more dangerous, um, then they run into the fact that there's an obligation to do, to do things. They and us, we have to become more rational and wise because we need the genuinely existing models. And secondly, we have to fill the social space, the internet, where all of the literature, where the data is being drawn with a lot more wisdom and rationality. These are huge <laughs> obligations on us um, that, and that sort of gives me hope because it's like there's a roadblock uh, for this project going a certain way that requires a significant reorientation towards wisdom and, and rationality in, in order for there to be any success. So I, I, before you get to the third point, I just want to... I, I haven't even got to the second point, oh, but go sorry, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to ask you one, one question based on what you said, is that my perception of the situation is that there's, an, there's actually a correlation between the diminishing in wisdom and the, you know, the diminishing in wisdom traditions and the desire to do this. It's like a yeah. sorcerer's apprentice situation <laughs> where the sorcerer would not have 
I would not have, you know, awoken all the rooms to, 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 to do it. It's like make little, the little, the little apprentice Mickey who doesn't know, you know, why to do things or why not to do things. That's why he's doing it in the first place. Yeah. I agree with so that. So there's a, it's like our society is moving away from wisdom. And that's it, one it, of the reasons why we're doing this in the first place. I, I, and again, I'm not denying that. Yeah. Um, what I'm saying is, we were, as we empower these things, their self-deceptive, self-destructive power is also going to go up exponentially. And we are going to start losing millions of dollars in our investment as they do really crappy, shitty, unpredicted things. And so there's going to be a strong economic incentive to bring in capacities for comprehensive, caring self-correction. And then my argument rolls in. Um, and so that's that's part of my response. Mm. The thing about uh, thinking of them of, of, of as children, um, uh, I mean, we do make our kids. We make them biologically, and we make them culturally. So I don't I, I don't want to get stuck in this word making. Uh, we we could be equivocating, and that's why we, we were using the term mentoring. Uh, the The idea there is we have two options for the alignment. We can either try and program them and hardwire rules into them so that they don't misbehave, which is going to fail if we move to the if we cross the threshold and decide we want to make these machines self-transcending like us and then what do we do what how do we solve that problem well the the only way the only machinery we have for solving that is the cultural ethical spiritual machinery of mentoring uh, that's how we do it with our kids uh, if we try to if we try to just somehow hardwire them for being the kind of agents we want them to be we will fail um and I, for me, I, I, I guess I'm trying to argue that's the only game in town we have. We either have programming or we have mentoring. Um, and I understand the risk. But if my answer to the first question has some validity to it and hopefully some truth, then the answer to the mentoring uh, becomes more powerful because that means we also have to become the best possible parents, you know, creating the best possible social discourse. The thing about the idol... Um, I, I take that very seriously. And that's what I mean when I said the theology is going to be the important science coming forward uh, because um, we're, we should not be trying to make gods. I agree with you. This is problematic. There are already cults building up around these AGIs. And I, war and I warned that that would happen in my essay, right? And I said that, and that's going to keep happening and it's going to get worse. Um, we hear about it happening in the organizations themselves, which is the yes, weird yes, right and the here, right? and the people who are doing wise AI are trying to challenge that, um, and so this is why I proposed uh, actually humbling these machines. This is why I call them silicon sages. I I I did that deliberately to try and designate that we are not making a god. What we're trying to do is make beings who are humbled before the true, the good, and the beautiful like us, and therefore form community with us rather than being. Um, somehow godlike entities that we're worshiping. Um, I, I would hope that, um, like, think about this. We, or we, we find it easy to conceive that they might discover depths of, of physics, and they're already discovering things in physics that human beings haven't discovered, and, and in medicine and stuff like that. Well, why not also in, you know, how human beings become wiser? Um, and, and, and so um, I... I I guess what I'm saying is I take all of your concerns for real, and I've tried to build in my proposal ways of responding to them. Um, I, I, I These machines should not be idolized. Um, I think they should become like um, – like you, like I mean, let me give you an example. I have many students who are now surpassing me. I taught them. I mentored them. And they're surpassing me. And unless you're a psychopath, that's what you want to happen. And then what they do is they enter and then they, they come back and they want to reciprocate. Right. And, and that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the Silicon Sages. Now, again, is this a high probability? Depends on the thresholds. Depends about whether or not the first and the second argument work. Um, but I'm still arguing there's a possibility that they could be Silicon Sages as opposed to being gods. Um because one of the one of the things, like I think, in almost all of the wisdom tradition that happens, is that the the wise or the enlightened one, if you want to use that, appears as nearly invisible to to most people. Yes, it's, right. It's so so Christ Sal talks about the seed, you know, the pearl, these little these things which you cannot, most people actually do not see that are hidden in reality. 
And then the the sages, you know, we have this image in the Orthodox tradition, for example, that they you know that there are there are people in the world that hold up reality by their prayers, but we don't know who they are. They are they are invisible by that very fact because there's something about wisdom which does that. And when a wise person appears too much, we hate them. We want to kill them. We right. they annoy us. They're they're a thorn in our side. And so this is another issue is that what you have is these beings that are extremely powerful, like massively powerful and have a massive reach and have a lot. There are things, uh, the reason why they exist, like I said, have all this economic drive towards them. Um, you know, the idea that that they would become these these sages in the way that we we tend to understand wisdom as being. To me, that brings the probability way down, you know, because of that, because of what, at least when we, what we understand wisdom to be what it looks like, yeah. it looks very different. It looks like the immobile meditating sage who gives advice, but so, doesn't do much. I want yeah. to push back on this because yeah. what's, what's in this is an implicit distinction between intelligence and a capacity for caring and a capacity for epistemic humility. Um, and I think when, when you move from intelligence to uh, rationality that you can't maintain that you can grow the one without growing the other uh that's that so th in fact this is why intelligence only counts for like maybe uh, 30 percent of the variance in rationality and even less of wisdom i i would put it to you that um if you concede that these machines could get vastly more powerful in terms of intelligent problem solving, then concede the possibility they could get vastly more powerful than us in their capacity for caring and caring about the normative and being vastly more powerful in the, uh, the capacity for humility as well. Um, and so, uh, and that's kind of what we see with these people, uh, right? We don't see them just becoming super polymaths. We see them actually demonstrating profound care, uh, it really enhanced relevance realization and profound commitments to reality uh, that we uh, properly admire. And they seem to want to help us as much as they can. And the, the point is these people don't just, and I think this is your point, they don't just slam into us like epistemic bulldozers. Right. They are, in fact, one of the things that is often admired about them, Socrates, Jesus, the Buddha, is their capacity to adapt and adjust to whoever their interlocutor is. Right. And again, let's imagine that capacity magnified as well. Um, so what I'm asking is, the, is don't, I mean, first of all, I admit it, if we don't cross a certain, certain threshold, we could just accelerate the intelligence and not accelerate these other things. I've, but I said, there's a deep, there are deep problems in that that will become economically costful, costly. And then if we imagine that rationality and wisdom are also being enhanced, then I think this addresses some of your concerns. David, uh, maybe I, yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe I can, I can uh, uh, stake out uh, my, my position because it, it, it sort of picks up on, uh, on that. And um, I've, I've got basically three, three points I want to uh, address that, that the first is, is precisely picking up there with the, the distinction between intelligence and rationality I, I i might have some issues with the with the the terms but um i i think that that distinction is really helpful and your point that rationality is caring is caring that there is no rationality without caring that um, you know the platonic notion yeah, totally. if um if truth is is in some sense caused by the good then one can't know without in some sense uh caring about about the good now um, as it relates to um, artificial intelligence, I think uh, I I have a, a serious problem with that very term, artificial intelligence. I and I and and um, I I wouldn't want to concede the word intelligence for just mind power. Uh, it seems to me that intelligence itself has this connection to um, caring, and I mean in the in the in the medieval um, vocabulary, um, in a way, intellectus is is the more profound level of of the mind than than ratio mm -hmm. um reason but that that's sort of a semantic point um let me put it in that the, the in the basic context that that i would want to raise and and this is something um i i, I don't hear addressed generally in the discussions it, it seems to me that um uh let, let me start by just making it the point concretely i i think that um i wonder whether in fact it's possible to be intelligent without first being alive 
Mm -hmm. that 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 there's something about the nature of a living thing yep. that yep. is what allows uh, intelligence to emerge and then and you know and what is that then exactly now um a, a more sort of subtle point and and uh that's related to that and i think that i think this is really a crucial point is is um and this is going to be the the thread of my whole set of comments here is that um we when we talk about um intelligence in machines what what we mean is in uh is intelligent behavior mm -hmm. um we're we're looking we're looking to see to what extent we can make machines act as if they are intelligent act as if they are conscious mm -hmm. uh and that that's actually profoundly different from being intelligent mm -hmm. um uh it's 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 a it's a it's a, a subtle sort of functionalistic substitute for the ontological reality of knowing if that makes sense mm -hmm. um we, we 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 see what kind of inputs and outputs what what things are able to do what they're able to accomplish um uh and even when we when we make those questions weighty and ethical and re religious and so forth we still tend to put them in terms of behavior and and achieving certain things um and i think that i think that that's actually um already missing something really profound which is uh that intelligence is in the first place a way of being before it's a way of acting and um um and and it's and it's analogous to what it means to be alive rather than just carry out functions that look like life um uh and you know if you want to go into the the metaphysics behind it um that kind both intelligence and life are impossible without a kind of unity that precedes difference that transcends that tra transcends difference and allows Mm -hmm. the different parts of a thing to be genuinely intrinsically related to each other. And then that relates to the question whether you can ever make a thing that's intelligent. Um, uh, the, the ontological conditions for life and therefore intelligence um, uh, include a kind of givenness, an already givenness, um, of, of of living things. That's why I mean, there's there's a profound distinction. It seems to me. I mean, this is crucial in the in the Christian creed between begetting and making, begotten and not made. Uh, living things beget each other, and and they're passing on a unity that they already possess. But when you make something, you're putting something together. And I I don't know if you can put something together that can have that genuine unity that allows it to be alive and allows it to be intelligent in this deeper sense okay so that's so whenever you functionalize something you make it replaceable um that's a uh, a principle from robert spayman if, if if something is defined by what it's able to achieve then you can make something else that can achieve that thing and it sort of it becomes a functional substitute but if you deny if you say that there's something deeper than function um, you're you're actually pointing to something that can't be replaced. Okay, so that's the first that's the first set of points. The second one um, has to do with the what 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 Jonathan called the the sort of transpersonal agency, and uh, that that I, I I think is a really serious um, question. And the and the way I would I would put it is um, th that there's something. So I, 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 it, um, I'm, I find that kind of a compelling point that there's there's a kind of a, an inherent logic in this in this um, um, pursuit that uh, makes us more a function of it, it than um, than it is a function of us. Uh, I mean that can be described in different ways, and there's a, certainly a dialectical relationship there. But there, but there is a certain sense in which that that this. There's a there's a kind of a um, a system that has a lo logic of a, of its own that makes demands on us like you know like the game um, theory logic that that uh, Jonathan you were talking about with like the, uh, 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 an arms race. I have a I have a colleague Michael Hamby who's been arguing for years. I think this is uh, really a profound point. Um, it's derived in some sense from Heidegger, but that that science science has always been technological. So that that in a way that the technological mindset is is precisely uh, presupposed to allow the world to appear in such a way that we make scientific discoveries that somehow 
that 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 the kind of technological spirit has been there from the beginning. And then he adds this point that technology in turn has always been biotechnological. Uh, the technology is always sort of aimed at a kind of replacement. And then one can add that I think, you know, biotechnology is always aimed for this sort of perfection of, um, you might say, what, uh, NOAA technology or something that, you know, replacing intelligence, that it'd be interesting to see, to think through. There'd be a lot to say about that. But um, I, I, I have this sense, you mentioned the economic dimensions of it I, I have a sense that, that, that there's there, there seems to be this this just fundamental pattern of thought that runs through all of the the modern institutions in politics in economics in science in the law um that share the same logic of a sort of a system that that um marginalizes the the genuine human participation um, uh, in order to perfect itself, and precisely because of that, recognizes no natural limits and just has this 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 um, tendency to take over, um, uh, to 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 um, you know um, encroach on 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 everything. And because it has no natural limit, it, it's I mean the the very sense of it is to go on. Now that sounds hopeless when one puts it that way, but but I I would pick up on a number of the things, John, that you were saying, and Jonathan too here, that that um that doesn't mean that there's no there's there's already hope in the very fact of raising questions. Um uh, we don't raise questions simply in order to be able to solve the problem, <laughs> mm -hmm. but our raising questions is actually our experiencing of humanity and opening up a depth that's that's the heart of the matter here, um, and and is always worthwhile, um, and and maybe in some ways is, is secretly like the saints praying to keep the world afloat. Having conversations like this is is mm -hmm. is is a contribution. I mean, I I can't help but think that. Okay, so that's the second set of comments. Then the third is um, is another dimension that I don't often hear um, uh, uh, discussed. And and you see, I mean, we're we're overlapping in all sorts of points, all of us, I think. But um, this question of alignment, for for me, the 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 the, the biggest worry, <laughs> in a certain sense, or at least the first principal one, the more urgent one, is the danger of our aligning ourselves to the machines. That we that we develop machines that have a have a certain kind of intelligence, and then we begin to conform our culture and our mode of being to fit them. I mean, the, and the problem is, we actually have thousands of examples of this. Um, we we come up with drugs that can address certain parts of of you know psychological disorders, and then we reinterpret the psyche in order to fit that solution to the problem. And and uh, my concern is that this 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 um, AI is not they're not just machines it's it's a whole culture or a whole way of being that we are are going to regard so so typically the the discussion is is uh, presupposes that you know we are going to remain unchanged and we're going to develop these machines that might become dangerous at a certain point attack us or something but I I think that that. We, we can't help but tr become transformed in our intercourse with them, in our making them, in our, uh, you know, I mean, in, in, in all sorts of in profound ways, but then also just really sort of obvious ways. I mean, they're going to start designing our homes and our buildings and our cities and our bus routes and our, um, you know, menus at the restaurants. And they're going to, to be writing our music and they're going to design our clothes. I mean, you know, increasingly, we're going to just um, conform to this. Uh, one of, you know, um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Walter Ong. It was kind of interesting. What is it about you Canadians that seem to have a special insight into these kinds of things? I, I don't know what it is, Walter Ong, Marshall McLuhan, but Walter Ong uh, talked about technology as an extension of consciousness. And that's why it's not neutral. When we use a machine, um, we're actually entering into it you know our spirit is entering into it in its use and in a certain sense conforming to it and that's that's always the case and it seems to me that's a, that's a a, a a a a particularly pointed way of putting this problem that you know um our 
uh, if AI is an extension of our own consciousness and it has all these features, John, that you were describing, a kind of heartless intelligence, um, are we going to, um, in a way, unconsciously and 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 uh, but pervasively um, uh, develop habits of heartlessness and modes of being, a heartless mode of being? Um, as a result. So uh, I'd, I'd have a thousand more things. Your, your essay was so provocative, John, as I said, I was, I was dreaming about it all last night and I, but I, I'm going to just stop there so we can have conversation, but thank you. So, so um, uh, first thing I want to say is uh, uh, that the, the first point you made about, um, I, the, if all my essay does is get people to raise questions the way we're doing, I'm happy. Right. Um, I, I, uh, I, I obviously believe in what I'm arguing or I'd be insane, but right. Uh, like the, the, like I'm very happy we're doing this right now. Yeah. Um, and so I want to, I want to, I, so I, I just want to set that out. Um, um, and I do think like you, and this is like the Heideggerian hope that that, that ability to get scientifically, philosophically and spiritual profound questioning going is a source of hope for yeah. us. Um, and, and, um, so I just want to acknowledge that and I'm fully aligned with that. Um, this is a, not, not part of the alignment problem. Okay. Um, <laughs> the thing about intelligence being a way of being, um, I think that's fundamentally right. I have made that argument extensively in about, uh, the, the work on, in, uh, predictive processing, relevance, realization, relevance, realization is not cold calculation. It can't be, it's how you care about this information and don't care about that information. And um, I've argued that you only can care about information and ultimately whether or not it's true, good and beautiful, if you are caring about yourself. You have to be an autopoietic thing. You have to be a self-making thing. I agree with you and I've argued scientifically, philosophically, there is no intelligence without life. The issue around, uh, I don't like the word artificial either because it generally means fraud or simulation. We should be saying artifactual. That would be a better term. Uh, but we, we have to be careful about what, what's going on there. The, the distinction between strong AI and weak AI is precisely the distinction of simulation versus instantiation. Yeah. Um, can we instantiate things artificially? We seem to have success in other areas. I'll take one that I think is non-controversial. And we, and we discovered something in the project. Um, uh, so for a long time, only, you know, evolved living things could fly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we figured out aerodynamics and we made artificial flight. And I think it would be really weird to say that airplanes are only simulating flight. That doesn't seem to be a correct, uh, because then my trip was only simulated and I didn't really go to Dallas. And all. so it's a real flight. And so the issue is, and we discovered something, uh, we discovered that the lift mechanism and the propulsion mechanism doesn't have to be the same thing the way it is in insects and birds. And that was a bona fide scientific discovery. That's why initially all the all the initial airplanes and helicopters are so stupid to our eyes, because they thought the lift thing and the propelling thing had to be the same thing, and they don't. And that's a discovery. And that's a real discovery of ontological import about the causal structure of things. Now, I, I, I think... I, I was careful to say, I don't, anybody who's rationally reflective about this wouldn't claim that these machines are strong AI yet. And I, and I positioned AGI as something that's trying to move. But if you remember, I critiqued and said that they are mostly simulating. They're parasitic on how we organize the data set, how we have encoded epistemic relevance into probabilistic relationships between sounds, how we have organized the internet in terms of what our attention finds salient. And we actually have to reinforce, do reinforcement, lean, uh, reinforcement learning with machines so they don't make wonky, uh, make wonky claims and conclusions. Uh, that's what I meant by saying it's a pantomime. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so if we wanted to give them intelligence as a way of being, which is one of the fundamental claims of 4E cog psi that we're talking about just, we're not talking just about the propositional. We're talking about the procedural, right. the perspectival, right. the participatory. Right. That's what I meant when I said, and I mean this strongly, it would depend on, and I'll, I'll change the term here, artifactual autopoiesis. Like if these things are not genuinely uh, 
taking care of themselves because they're moment by moment making themselves. There's no reason for them to care about any of the information they're processing. And this goes towards the defining difference between a simulation and an instantiation. These machines are doing everything they're doing for us. For it to be real intelligent, they have yeah. to be doing it for themselves. That's mm -hmm. that's understanding. And yeah. that's why that I'm, I'm tightening your point and I've been arguing yeah. it yeah. for a long time. Now, what I yeah. want you to hear is that this project of not just making artificial computation, but making autopoetic mm -hmm. learning in problem solvers is also ongoing. Some of my yeah. grad students are working on these projects of creating auto, auto catalytic systems that are also problem solving. Michael Levin's been doing work, like driving down into the biochemistry. Like So again, I agree with the point, but it's whether or not, it's not the case that nobody is working on that problem. This is what I mean why the, the I, threshold is possible. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can I just jump in there? I mean, yeah. And I and I should I should have prefaced. I didn't mean the points I was making as like a criticism of your presentation, because I I I, no, no, I understand I you you've got such rich thinking on this area. I was mainly using it as a springboard to make some general. Okay. So yeah, just so just just so that Oh, clear. I I hope I wasn't coming off as offensive. No, 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 I'm no, not. No. I'm not. I, I'm I just wanted to be clear and I'm, I'm <laughs> okay, good. that it wasn't wasn't a crit critique. But um I, I would wanna I, I don't know. And I'd ha and I, I'd have to think this through some further, but I don't know that um, the difference between the 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 being conscious and behaving consciously um, is this is quite the same thing as simulation and uh, the distinction between the the instance and okay. the instantiation and simulation. I'd want to say this because even like the the. The, the the flying i mean that's still a, a, a um an activity a kind of an operation that's that's being but so is living right embodied. So. well so that's yeah well that's that's what i i don't i you know that's funny i'm i'm actually working on a paper um on this question about metaphysics and life and i discovered that um uh philosophers have typically um when they try to understand what life is they have typically reduced it to certain kinds of activities or operations and no. I, I think there's something more profound and yeah, this is why it, yeah cook i mean it's one thing to be able to create something that can actually fly but could you could you create something that is a bird and that that is that that um would 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 experience just the what it means to be <laughs> you know i mean this is you know about what you know what it means to be a bat that kind of thing i suppose but um there's there's a subtle dimension fly. That wouldn't be a parasite on our own. Yeah, fly. that's what. But, yeah. but but airplanes aren't in, parasitic on yeah. our ability to fly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's why I the use the analogy. To fly is, yeah. Okay, but but uh, and 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 that's the and that's okay. Uh, and that falls into you know a tool versus an agent, and and I get that. Yeah. But, but I want I want to push back the philosophy of biology, and I you know Dennis Walsh is one of my colleagues is very much about no no this and this is your point. Right? It's not just bottom up. In order to understand life, it's not just bottom up causation. We have to understand top down constraints. We have to understand the way possibility is organized. And we have to talk about virtual governors and virtual, like it is no longer the, the bumpation. It's no longer just this bottom up. The, uh, the, the philosophy of biology is pushing very strongly on, well, is evolution really a thing? Well, if it's really the thing, then there's top down as yeah. well as bottom up. And this is part of this theorizing, and it's and this theorizing is being turned towards this. Now, again, we again, I'm not making a prediction. Yeah, we have yeah. a threshold. We can just decide, and we might decide for all the Malachian forces and all the things you're <laughs> saying about how we might just we might just diminish our sense of humanity in the face of these machines. But but I'm also I want you to accept that's also not an inevitability. There are mm -hmm. there are alternatives available to us, and that they could be pursued. Um, yeah. And so, I, I mean, these machines aren't put together the way we put a table together. We don't mm -hmm. even program mm -hmm. these machines anymore. That was yeah. the big revolution that Hinton made. We make them so they're dynamically self-organizing, and they basically organize themselves into their capacity we don't make may, it may I, yeah can i jump in on that point that's one thing that I, I i would like to think through further is there is there a difference between being autopoietic as you're saying and 
begetting another, like re reprodu like genuinely reproductive. And that, that's that's where I, I think it would start to get really, really interesting is is if a machine could beget another, because I, uh, that that would imply a different a very different ontology, I would think. So, so there's two there's two things here and um, there's two issues. I, I, I think it, it um, I mean, autopoetic things are uh, are ontologically different from self-organizing things because mm -hmm. they're self-organized to seek out the conditions that produce, protect and promote their own existence. And so right. that that right. would that, that means right. none of the machines we have, like LLMs, are anywhere near being auto autopoietic. They are yeah. not just made. They are self-organizing, but self-organization is in between right. making and auto autopoiesis. Yeah. Now, the thing about reproduction is, and I, you know, I, I worry that there's a crypto vitalism in here. That there's some sort of secret, special stuff uh, <laughs> to life or to consciousness that isn't being yeah. captured. And the yeah. problem I have, the problem I have with that, and I'll, I'll just shut up after I state sure. my problem, is that seemed to commit you to claiming that. Yeah, you know these it, a, a kind of dualism. Well, isn't consciousness causal? Isn't it causal of my behavior and causally responsive to my behavior? And doesn't that mean there's a huge functional aspect to it? Can you really make this clean distinction between being conscious and like causing my behavior and having my behavior cause cause changes in my state of consciousness? I don't know what that would mean. Same thing with being alive. Yeah. I, I do think it's a profoundly subtle and 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 maybe um, some something that can't be articulated. There's something that requires um, mm. uh, intuition rather, you know, insight rather than um, propositional. I mean, to use your, your so, but 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 um, well, I don't David, mean. Can I just that, interject? Yeah, remember, I just want to make sure we're clear. I yeah. argued that we could this project could show that. Yeah. This yeah. project could show that no, the machines just yeah. can't get there. We have something. Right. It right. would give. Right. It would give. I think pretty convincing yeah. evidence that yeah. we have this ontological special. Yeah, I, I find that a really interesting part of your argument. A really interesting and and that and as and especially illuminating. Also, you know, I mean, in a way, uh, these these experiments can teach us about the nature of intelligence precisely in the in the interesting ways that they fail. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. but but I do. I, you know, in terms of the du dualism, I I um I don't think that there's some secret stuff that is life. But I do think that there's a a, a profound difference between form and matter. To use you know sure. to use the sort of yeah. classical philosophical language, and that f form is not a special kind of matter. It's something that's of a very different sort. And it's on the basis of that that you know Aristotle. It's kind of interesting. This is this is how he he um uh connects so uh you know in the in the sort of classical tradition what you're calling autopoietic um a, a simple word for it is growth you know assimilating yep. things from outside and have that mm -hmm. um increase the complexity of the organism but what, what's really interesting is that according to aristotle um the the power of of the organism that is connected to nutrition and growth is also connected to i think automatically is connected to reproduction and the and the reason is that um reproduction rather than just thinking of it materials materialistically as like generating more things um reproduction is uh aut the autopoiesis of the form of the organism itself so mm -hmm. that bird it's not just this bird that wants to increase its existence and therefore eats and so forth but that the the birdness of the bird also wants to increase itself and that that, that means that it sort of generates and those are those are actually forms of the same power the the same dimension of of, of the being that's a, that's what i'd like that's what, you know i used to say just sort of kind of in a silly way I will take a, uh, an AI machine seriously when I see it poop. <laughs> and what I meant by that was, you know, it's that's a sign that it's actually got a kind of an organic relationship to its environment. Um, yeah. Uh, it would and, poop, and, and, it poops and, a lot. It just that doesn't know. <laughs> we have to tell it that it poops. <laughs> we have to tell it, no, that's poop. It does, this, yeah. yeah. It, does, it doesn't care about it's pooping. Yeah, it doesn't care about it's pooping. Yeah, and energy, uh, uh, 
uh, pollution is not the heat pollution is not the same thing. But anyway, no, but I mean, even in terms of what it is as a large language model and how it spits out uh, content, we, yeah. we have to tell it this. Oh, is, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's this not in dispute. Discarded, this is to be this is to be kept. Um, I love David. I think your idea. I mean, this is one of the th I mentioned this before, like the surprising that the surprise that Darwin in some ways brought Plato back, you know, in, in the idea of how we can we can understand uh evolution evolution as the persistence of being and even in the in the notion of forms that there is this idea that there are identities which are being preserved in reproduction uh this is a very interesting idea that i hadn't thought about in terms of ai but i'd like to hear john what you think about that yeah uh, and so again um uh for ecogsi alicia urero is a prime and she's explicitly developed to work uh uh, she calls herself an Aristotelian and the mm. idea that we we understand form, we're getting an understanding of it in terms of constraints on a system. And like I said, be, uh, autopoiesis is not defined solely in terms of causal relationships, bottom up. It's defined in terms of top down constraint relationships, the form, the formal cause. Um, yeah. And so uh, and then, of course, you know, Darwin needs Mendel. Uh, there is a there is an instantiation uh, right of a code uh, in formation in your DNA that is responsible for your reproduction, and again, I, I'm not saying it isn't difficult or challenging, but I don't hear an argument in principle by why autopoetic things that artifactual autopoetic things uh, wouldn't have something like that kind of uh, I don't know what to call. I mean, it. to 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 the extent, would you? I mean, I. Um, um... Would it be conceivable that you would have a thing that would want to reproduce? I guess I guess even want is a, such a hard concept, but um, I mean, because you could say yes, we could teach it that that this is something it needs to do, just like we could we could we could you know, sort I, of. I don't know if living things want to reproduce. I mean, we may because we we can create a reflective space where we consider the possibilities. I don't know if mosquitoes want to reproduce. I think they just reproduce as part of what they are. Um, That's interesting. I, I I think they have to want to in some sense. I mean that that they're they they feel a drive. I mean, so, right? They does don't. Does the consciously... wanting go down to paramecium? Because paramecium's reproduce. Do you, are they wanting? Yeah, I, see, I think I think anything that is living at all has a kind of natural inclination to reproduce itself. Yeah, I, and I, that, I don't disagree yeah. with that point. Okay, and, and okay, I even right. just I even understand. Yeah, that there's something. I see what you're that, saying. There has to be some sort of like very primitive caring about right. information. But yeah. I don't. Yeah, yeah I, I, want I, is not a good word there. I, yeah, yeah I, 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 but I do think I do think I, I'm trying to get you know, and I hope I'm not trying to be just self-presentational. But I've represented to both of you for ecog sci in a lot of discussions and about how much it is this multi-leveled, bottom-up, top-down thing, and we're talking as much. Yeah about constraints as we are about causes and that is that is that is the cutting edge of the philosophy of biology right now mm -hmm. and i agree with you i think i think it's a kind of heliomorphism that is emerging mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. of this understanding and the thing i'm i'm also i guess bearing witness to you about is people are taking that understanding and putting it into like art, artifactually uh, emergent things, um, yeah. and, and they and um, and they're also doing. I just want to put something yeah. that's also there. Uh, yeah, we don't just make kids bio biologically. We 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 enculturate them. Yeah. But there's and that's the Hegelian argument that I referenced earlier. But there has been there's an ongoing project to create socio cultural robotics. Josh Chanenbaum and others. Um, it's like. I'm asking people, and this is part of asking the good question. Don't just zero in on the LLMs. Yeah, yeah. The artificial, the artifactual life, the social cultural robotics projects are also going, and there is a real potential for these three to come together in a powerful way that isn't being properly addressed in a lot of the conversation. Yeah. May I, I may I pick up on that point and then direct it to Jonathan here? So yeah, I'll shut up. I've been talking too much. No, no, this is, but, but that, 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 that's an interesting thing. If you think of uh, intelligence in this more organic way and then bring in the cultural uh, element that um, it raises something that, that occurred to me um, uh, in this context, it'd be kind of fun to hear your thoughts, but uh, can you envision, you know, it, would it be, and, and, and John, you'd have 
have cer certainly something to say uh, about this too. Would it be possible to to envision um, a kind of artificial intelligence can, that can read symbols that can actually recognize and I mean because the, there's no culture without you know human culture without the symbolic just is pervasive in human culture um what what, what kind of intelligence is required to mm. understand and react and engage with and is that something that is conceivable that that uh, a machine of this complex however complex can do well, I, I've seen, I mean, I've been playing with ChatGPT and I, Jordan Peterson has been playing with ChatGPT on this regard. And this is the this is the issue is that there oh. it's actually in the large language model is encoded the analogies that yeah. that basically support symbolism. And so the, the ChatGPT can give you a pretty good, if you're able to ask the question properly, ChatGPT is actually quite good at seeing uh, analogies that, that would be part of symbolic understanding. The difficulty, just like anything, is that just because the, the the so the the model can help you, like if you already have natural insight, can help you right. maybe see things that you hadn't seen before. But it would also just be gibberish to the type to the person that doesn't have that insight. So I don't think that the insight is there in the model. But what no. it has is a probabilistic capacity to predict, uh, you know. Right relationships and analogical relationships and so it's a it's actually can be a tool an interesting tool for symbolism because sometimes you can you can prompt it uh if there do you, like do you see a connection between these two images and then it'll give you some examples and then you have this it can it has this surprise where you can actually find uh you can actually find relationship that you hadn't thought about this is <laughs> this is something by the way that this is going to weird people out but this is something that I think has existed for a very for a very long time and is there in kind of what we call gematria and rabbinical reading of uh, scripture is that they use mathematical models right. to right. find structures in language that aren't contained at the surface level of of um of the of the usual analogies and so they 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 send they send requests through mathematical calculations to find surprising connections that then prompt their intuition to to be able to find connections that they hadn't thought found before and then you have to then make sense of those intuitions obviously if they're random they'll just kind of follow fall away but this is actually this brings me to the to the to the to the point that I wanted to make which is the relationship between at least a large language model because that's what that we know most and mm -hmm. and divination um divination yeah and divination okay. yeah okay, okay. yeah so so we talked about the idea that intelligences have to be alive, but I think that most traditional cultures understand that there are types of intelligence that are not alive, at least not mm -hmm. alive in the right. way that we understand uh, that we understand alive in terms of biological beings that that that, that are right. born and die. You know that uh, that they had a sense that there are agencies and intelligences that are transpersonal, and that that don't. Then in some ways run through hu human behavior and run through humanity, um, and those would be those intelligences would be contained in our language. Like they would necessarily be uh, contained in the relationship between words and and uh, and systems of words, like you know all the the syntax and the grammar and all of that. Uh, what I see is that I think that ancient people had. And I don't understand it, and I want to be careful, like because I don't understand. It. But I think ancient people had mechanistic ways of tapping into those types mm -hmm. of intelligences, and they 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 would have mechanistic ways, whether it was tossing something or throwing things, looking at relationships, almost like uh, random relationships, and then qualifying those random relationships uh, was a way in order to tap into types of intelligences that ran through their own their own thing and and what i see is a relationship with the way that the large language models were trained seem to be something like that which is that the 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 models generated random random information and then you would have humans qualifying that that rent that random random connections and then qualifying it qualifying it through iterations so at at some point then they would become like a a kind of tech a technical 
it's a, a technical way to access intelligent patterns that are that are coming down into into the model um and so that is something that i see there's a connection between those two and that what that means is that just like divination the 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 thing that i worry about the most is again the sorcerer's apprentice problem mm -hmm. which is that mm -hmm. those intelligences that are contained in our language we do not people don't know what humans want people don't yeah. know what people don't know what the, all the motivations that are that are driving us they don't totally understand them they don't understand also the transpersonal types of motivations that that can drive us or that can run through our our societies you know sometimes right. you can see societies get become possessed with certain things i think that's happening now in terms of certain ide ideologies and things like that uh and so the fact that my point is, is that the fact that on the one hand, we don't understand these types of intelligences. And I think that the way that the, the, the models are trained and the way that they function seem to be analogous to the ancient divination practices, like a hyper version of that. That, how can I say this? Is that there is a great chance that we'll catch something without knowing what we're catching. That we will basically manifest things that we have no idea what they are, and we don't understand the consequences of it, and we don't, you know, because we are we're just like playing in a field of of intelligent patterns and all this chaos without even knowing what it is we're doing. Uh, and I think that we saw that, like, you know, if you remember the Bing AI, that little moment when it was kind of unleashed on us, and then all of a sudden the AI was acting like your. You know, like you know the the psychotic X or was 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 becoming paranoid or was doing all these things it's and and you could see that what was going on was basically the these 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 patterns were running through and they hadn't put yeah. the right constraints around them to 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 prevent those types of patterns to run through and those were easy because you recognize your psycho X very very easily <laughs> yeah. but there are patterns like that that I don't think I don't think we have the the wisdom to recognize as it's manifesting itself, and that as these things get more powerful and more powerful, that they will they will run through our society, and we won't even know it's happening until it's too late. Uh, so that's my biggest warning on AI. Is I basically, you know, to to sound really scary, is that I think we're 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 trying to we're trying to manifest God without knowing what we're doing. And that will sound freaky to the secular people. But then if you don't like the word gods, think that there are motivations and patterns of intelligence that have been around for 100,000 years that have, that have been running through human societies. And they're contained in our, in our language structures. And, and, and if we just use that, play around with that with massive amounts of power, uh, then we might have them run through us without even knowing what's going on. I'd yeah, like I mean, respond. and you say patterns of intelligence, uh, just just one comment, just uh, the patterns of intelligence, I mean, to pick up John, patterns of intelligence, which also are patterns of caring of a certain sort or not caring. I mean, there's a there's that existential dimension that's really crucial. But uh, John, go ahead. Um, I think this is an excellent point, and I want to address it at, at, at a little bit at length. Um, uh, so first of all, when we say these machines predict if we were speaking very carefully, what they're predicting is what we, and I don't just mean us individually, I mean we collectively would do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so th that's what they're avatars of our of the collective intelligence of our distributed cognition. Um, and so again, uh, that lends weight to Jonathan's point, um, which I want to do. And I do think that um, the way in which we have encoded uh, Let's, I'll just use a term epistemic relevance, like how things are relevant cognitively into probabilistic relationships between sounds or marks on paper or, or and how we've encoded it into the structuring of the internet and how we encode it and how we gather data and create these data sets um, and how we and how we how we come up with our intuitive judgments on these machines. We don't know how we're doing a lot of that. 
that goes back to my concern that we have hacked our way into this without knowing our way into this. So I take what Jonathan is saying very seriously because I think it is a strong implication of a point I made at the very beginning. My greatest fear, my students from like 2001 will tell you that John Verveke was worried that we would hack our way into this rather than knowing our way into mm -hmm. this. Um, um, I don't think that knowing is sufficient for wisdom, but it's certainly all the philosophers argue that it's a it's a necessary condition in some fashion. Um, about that, um, two things to note is that the LLMs, of course, don't have insight in the sense of being properly self-transcending the way they we are. What they're doing is they're predicting how we would be self-transcendent. <laughs> Yeah. because of all the ways we have been self-transcended in the past. And that 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 goes back to your point, David, about at right. this at that stage, we're doing simulation, not instantiation. Because the, again, the machine isn't caring, the self-transcendence isn't it actually transcending as a self, which is, I think, definitional for real self-transcendence. Um, and, and so right now, all I'm doing is just saying, I'm just, I'm, I'm pouring uh, gasoline on Jonathan's fire. Yeah. Uh, and, and, <laughs> So the fact that there are these huge patterns at work. Now, one thing is, you know, you have Strzok's book on divination in the ancient world. And uh, what's really interesting, uh, for example, and this is cross-cultural, but he's talking mostly about the Greek world, is there was a very strong distinction between sorcery and divination. Uh, sorcery was criticized both uh, uh, morally and epistemically, and but divination was taken seriously and it was carefully cultivated. And there was a, there was this there was a there was a social cultural project of distinguishing the two, trying to like really really constraining this one and really reverentially cultivating a proper participation in the other one. So again. Uh, uh, you know, uh, existence is proof of probability. This is a possible project for us. Um, and, and this is, again, what I mean when I say theology is going to be one of the most important sciences in the future. We have mm -hmm. to understand how we enter into proper uh, right reverential relationships with things we only have an intuitive grasp of that in very many ways significantly exceed us. Mm -hmm. Yes, and 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 secularism has kind has kind of wiped out our education of how we relate to beings that might be more grander than us by eradicating a religious sensibility, uh, and that has put us uh, bereft us. So now I think I've strengthened Jonathan's argument mm -hmm. a lot, and but I do say we do if, let's take note of what the ancient cultures have done. We can learn from them. We have a proof that this can be handled well. Um, and, and, and secondly, um, it goes back to my point. If we like, this is going to, because of the monstrosities that come out, this is going to put increasing pressure on us to confront that threshold of, do we want to make them self transcendent? Do we want to make them? And David, by rational, I don't mean logical. I mean that capacity. Right, right. No, I understand that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and so, um, and I think that what I'm saying is I, I think that strengthens the argument that we're going to be pushed by the, the monstrosity of a lot of this to say, oh, we better get these machines uh, self-corrective and, and properly right oriented towards normativity. Um, and again, uh, that's a yeah. that's a doable project. Because um, one, if so I, I imagine yeah, like if ahead. I was if I held the keys to open AI, like if I was one of those that could peek behind the mask, have you seen that image of the, the Cthulhu monster with like the happy face on it? Like, that's yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. the yeah. images of open AI, which is like, you know, we have this like little, little window into what's there, but behind is this massive thing. But like, if I had the keys to, to, to those large language models, let's say the, the absolute open door to them, you know, it would be very, wouldn't it be easy to just manifest the God of war and, Win, like when it would well, no, no. okay, 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 but let's let let's take a historical example. Yeah, we yeah. unleashed a, a godlike power with atomic warfare, and the monstrosity of that made we, we just the, the the purely game theoretic machinery built all of these constraints mm -hmm. around it, yeah, right. And then we also are on the verge, possibly, of getting like readily usable 
uh, you know, nuclear power, which I think is the only way we could ever actually go green. I think all the renewable stuff is going to be like 10% of our energy needs. Um, and if, if we're going to, if we're going to save the environment and not destroy civilization, I think nuclear power is going to be essential. A lot of people are making those arguments and we have a lot of stuff that we could be doing, the liquid fuel thorium reactors and stuff. But what I'm saying is there's opportunity here too. Yeah. Right? There's yeah. Real opportunity. No, and I, I, I really take that point, but it, it is interesting. I mean, we've, we've put thousands of constraints on the use of nuclear weapons, but we've continued to develop them and improve them and make better and even more destructive ones. I mean, and it'd yep. be interesting to see if we've ever at any point um, said, you know what, our nuclear weapons are actually strong enough. They're powerful enough and we don't need to advance them anymore. So collectively, I mean, th is there an instance of something like that where we say, you know what, we've actually reached the, the, the limit because we don't, we wouldn't really need it for anything further. Um, I mean, that's a. Well, I mean, there was, question. there was, I, yeah. there, there was a salt treaty and there was a reduction both in the power and the number of nuclear weapons. And, and then of course, you know, the game theoretic things, they figured a little bit of way around it. And it's always this to and froing. Um, um, uh, well, let me, I want to give an example of, of something that can run through. And I, the reason I, it's a very, it's very, cause I remember, I realized I was being too abstract before. So like they say sacrifice, sacrifice is a, is a human universal. It runs through all civilizations. Uh, mm -hmm. human sacrifice runs through all civilizations for the last, you know, tens of thousands of years. It seems to be a puzzle, uh, that humans are trying to deal with without understanding it completely just through rational means they're playing it out they're trying to understand it uh scapegoating seems to be an, an important aspect of of identity formation and so that is a program that runs through humanity and that most people are completely unaware of and are com and are not conscious of and don't take consciously into their into their mind when they're making decisions, they act unconsciously with that process that is running through them. Um, and so that is an example to me of a, of a program that runs and that is contained and is contained in our, our language structures, uh, our language structures that have been building up for, you know, tens of thousands of years that we're not aware of. So if you have a, so this is again, the problem, like if you have a system that's extremely powerful, and that is running these types of programs of scapegoating and of and of identity formation. And the people involved in it are not aware that that's how identity formation works. That is the type of danger that I'm talking about. Like this is a real thing that as we give these, these systems uh, a kind of power over us or they become the things we go to in order to, to get our decision-making, um, that those things could be running through without people even realizing what's happening and that decisions would be made based on these structures without, like I said, without even knowing. Uh, those are the things that, those are, that's just one example, but that's a, a very simple example that we can kind of, yeah. we could track and we could see that, you know, the, the ancient, because when we talk about ancient divination, we have to remember that it's like, the ancient gods asked for, for blood, my friends. Like those programs, they asked for blood and they knew that you had to kill a bunch of people on that pyramid in order to continue your civilization. Like it's, and that's, that is encoded in our culture and is encoded secretly in our, our language. Uh, you know, and, and so an example, like I do believe that, let's say that the Christian story is a way to deal with that, but mm -hmm. the, the rest is still all there. And we we default to it really fast without even like World War II is a lot of that stuff going on. Sure, World War and, I especially, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, the the point is um, that just as there's these implicit monsters that we have sewn in unaware, um, there are also the implicit counter actors I, well, maybe angels if, if, I, if i'm allowed to speak myth mythologically that we've also sewn in um yeah. and i mean there's the actual revolution you see the buddha you see plato really undermining the grammar of sacrifice and of course mm -hmm. jesus of nazareth does that in a profound way um and we have to remember that th that's there too uh, and what that requires is putting into the data set and altering the pathways in the internet so that this information goes into these machines as well. And 
Again, is that happening right now? No. Uh, could it happen? Yes. And it might happen if these machines start sacrificing themselves. And we might have to say, why are they doing it? like and we'd like and this again, we'll at some point we have to decide, are we gonna let them be really massively self-destructive? And the economic powers are not gonna imagine if every time you try to make an atomic bomb it kept dissolving. Right, like, like you, you, you'd, you'd stop pumping money in. Yeah, um, it won't. Sac they won't sacrifice themselves. They'll sacrifice us. Well, <laughs> but, but why? We don't. We we sacrifice ourselves. Yeah. Well, we. I mean, let's say uh, the 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 scapegoat mechanism is usually to find a no, another sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but we, we invoked World War Two. We weren't killing goats and chickens. We were killing each other and our own populations in a huge sacrificial act. And yeah. I, I, that's what I was picking up on, right? When it becomes titanic and monstrous, that's where it moves to. But I'm saying is like, this is a Jungian term, right? like, yeah, it, like the idea that, yes, there's all this pre-egoic stuff sewn in, but there's also a lot of trans-egoic stuff sewn in. And we just have to properly get it in there so that we've got the, you know, the collective self-correction going on like we did. I mean, civilizations get some self-correcting processes in here because they don't devolve. No, they periodically, uh, periodically massively collapse. Um, and that's, by the way, that's something I made, an argument I made in my paper. These things can't accelerate to an infinity of intelligence. There is built-in diminishing returns. There's built-in general system collapse to these things. So again, we have to be careful about I mean, we don't know what the limit is, and our imag our intuitive imagination is not good. We know that there are hard and fast a prior arguments that that, that this will threshold at uh, this will at some point. Um, and uh, and that also gives me comfort. Um, at least, uh, like encoded in our myth in our mythology, there seems to be some stories of the relationship between transpersonal agency and technology as being the cause of the end of a of a civilization, right? That mm -hmm. the whole Enochian, Enochian tradition seems to be encoding something like that through mythological language, which is that humans were able to, to connect somehow with these transpersonal intelligences and that those were encoded in technical means and that this brought about the, the end of an age. Uh, so yeah. it's like, yeah, so there it's like it's there that part of it is there in our story too. Like it there there is that yeah. story was told. Yeah, but there's, no, there's no, also across cultures, there's the Noah story. Yeah, there's the there's the, yeah. the person that has yeah. the right relationship to ultimacy. That's right. That's right. right? And, and he and there's a technological response, the arc yeah, that's is right. built. I agree, right? I agree. I totally agree so, to that. I and mean, then even like in the in the, the revelation image that I've have given several times, you have these two images. One is the beast that creates an image of itself and makes it speak and then seduces everybody by the speaking image, you know, that, and then there's this other image of a right relationship of technic technicity and civilization to the transcendent. These two kind of are, are yeah. put up against each other as two possible uh, outcomes. I mean, the, the question that, that arises for me in this context um, uh, uh, connects this question with a with a with I, I think what what strikes me is kind of an interesting philosophical question but um John you made the distinction between divination and sorcery and mm -hmm. and um as I understand it um and you can um correct me on this but um at the at the foundation of that uh distinction is the difference between you know sorcery would be in a way using the trans personal powers, these sort of higher powers, whereas divination would be in a way receiving, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, disposition of receptivity. So in one case, you've got um, human ends that you that you try to then enlist the help of uh, superhuman forces to, to and the the irony is it's precisely when you're trying to use something that you become used yourself. And that's that's where you get this dialectic, whereas divination it's entering into a relationship where where one uh, disposes oneself to hear and receive, uh, and therefore, in a certain sense, conform to something greater than oneself. Mm -hmm. And there, you see, it's a very different kind of thing. And ironically, in a way, um, you enter into it more receptive, receptively. But that's precisely why you don't become then a tool of it. Uh, interestingly, now, now the, for for me, the question is um, how that relates to this. Uh, Mm -hmm. issue is is you know it may be the case that you've got encoded in the language both um 
sacrifice in the sense of violence, you know, Rene Girard, the scapegoat thing mm -hmm. on the one hand, and then the other hand, um, self-sacrifice in the sense of, of, of generous love and so forth. Those, those might both be encoded in, in the language, but here's, here's the question to me it is, is it possible the kind, um, the, the kind of receptivity that divin divination implies, the capacity to actually see an other as other and recognize and be open in this kind of radical way, is that something that a machine can ever learn to do? Um, is, is it possible actually to behold an other simply, you know, um, uh, uh, or, or is there, or is there, a, you know, is it, it, it and, and I, it, it seems to me that there's something profoundly different between seeing truth, genuinely seeing truth on the one hand and being self-corrective on the other. Mm. And the, the kind of genuinely seeing what's true. Um, I, you know, I don't know if that in itself can be encoded in language. We can tell stories about people that did that, but can, can the actual insight into truth be encoded simply in past. Do you, do you see, do you see what I'm, the, the yeah, I question do. I'm okay. raising? Okay. So um, I, again, I think that if we, again, open up beyond the propositional and we're talking about being true to, and, mm -hmm. um, and your aim being true, um, mm -hmm. and that we, the machine has perspectival abilities, noetic abilities, not just Dianetic abilities and we can't use that term because of l ron hubbard but you know what i meant uh right um and again this is the the and this is part of the argument uh that uh, at the core of my work um uh, you know um it's like so in a moment of insight you're not just self-correcting you are attracted and drawn into you you love the new reality that is disclosed because there's a perspectival and participatory thing. That's what I meant when I yeah. said there isn't real self-transcendence unless there's a self that is transcending, right? Yeah, um, right, right. Okay, now, the, and then the question is, and but we're back to our fundamental ontological yeah. questions. It, it is, and I've already said, there, uh, there's no way a Newtonian mechanical computation is going to get there. And so I, I, I won't be bound to that because I'm not bound yeah, to that. I have a, yeah, yeah, I have a professional yeah. career of, of criticizing that. <laughs> right, right? Right. So uh, is there is there a dynamical systems updated, heliomorphic, auto uh, poetic possibility? I think there is. Uh, I think there is. A, I think the answer is uh, a, a very real yes for that. Um, and I don't think we're going to find the answer to that just encoded in the syntactic and semantic relationships between our terms. I think we have to look in, yeah. you know, our inaction, how we're in, in, right. enacting, embedded, extended, right, and embodied in a profound way to get those answers. Um, and so um, my answer is, in that way, a qualified yes, I do think it is uh, possible. And, so just, it, and just the problem to... is that, go ahead, go ahead, say what you well, need to say, to... please be really precise just so i understand so um we, we've been talking about this sort of predictive like calculating probabilities um uh drawing on everything that's ever been said and being yeah. able to derive in some sense from that um do, do you think that that it, we can get to a moment where we actually transcend that 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 cross that threshold beyond that not with the llms as they are that's my argument not with the llms as they are they can't get there yeah, I, uh, that's why I, John's it, radical proposition is to is to embody, we, embody to, and enculture them, and that is the only way we will actually get properly rational beings and beings that care yeah. about it and care about. Right. Self, self I mean, but that's that, I mean that's the irony in the question. You know, can we give them more and more models to teach them at some point to to not have to use models? And and I mean, the, do, do you see? It's it's actually really I I I don't. But I we don't do that with that kids. It's possible without right? But but kids have a soul. You know, uh, it's possible yeah, to yeah. do that if you have. And but I don't mean this as like woo woo stuff. I mean that they that they, that that a natural but, thing has a principle of unity that transcends the differentiation of the parts and allows those parts to be intrinsically related to each other. And that that principle of unity that transcends the differentiation of, of the parts that allows them to be an organism actually allows them at the same time to have a kind of unity with something other than themselves 
that transcends the parts of their differentiation. So there's a kind of an intimacy there. I, I agree with that ontology. Yeah. <clears throat> and what I'm arguing is dynamical systems theory is now giving explanations of that that are derived from Aristotelian uh, ontology, but make use of uh, like a lot of cutting edge science that we've uh, yeah, like we now can start to explain how there is a unity that is not reducible just to some summation of its parts, and how that yeah. unity has a top-down influence on the entity yeah. that is not reducible to its causes, and 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 and, and I think this is becoming a non-controversial thing to say. Yeah. And I find, and now we might just add a clash of intuitions, and I'm willing to stop there. I can't see there being, like that seems to me to be capturing what we're talking about. And you have an intuition that there's something more, but I don't know, I don't see a something more. And maybe that's yeah. where we're sitting. Yeah. Well, I think it's the, the the intuition David has, and tell me if I'm wrong, David, and because it connects with the way I think is that there's, it's that unity is given. It yeah. cannot be made. And right. and I know that sounds weird, but it's some it's somehow it's like if I'm making even even in terms of technology, right? It's like if I'm making a car, that unity is given. I'm I'm gathering things towards that purpose, right? And, and so the the purpose, the you the unity part of something is always it comes from heaven in the sense that you can't make it. It it's given from from it's it's already taken for granted even before you start to unify multiplicity uh, together, and that in the making of these beings, we have that problem. It's like we're doing it completely. We're doing it bottom up. We're like if we can we gather as enough stuff so that this stuff reaches yes. a unity. That, right. That, See, that, and that, I, I, if I just could just, uh, yeah. it seems to me that if this is ever going to be possible, it would have to take, so I'm, and when I raise the question, it's a, actually a question, so I don't mean to be like challenging that it can't possibly happen. I'm just thinking about what would be the condition. Please that, remember that I said yeah, we yeah, might realize yeah. that we can't, and that would be important. I am well, not. Yeah, but I, right? I, so, so it seems to <laughs> me if, if, if it were to be possible, it would have to be something like um, a kind of, um, uh, electronic um, analog to cloning that you that you take. So what have I told you that we now have uh, uh, electro bio like we have systems that are electrochemical biological yeah. uh, versions right. of memory that are now in production and they we don't make them they yeah. self organize and emerge and they emerge bottom up from the causal interactions but they are right. also top down constrained by you know principles of self-organization like that yeah. already exists yeah yeah and but right no so well that's that's what i'm asking about because because it, it seems to me but there is there is going to be you're you're deriving not from models you're deriving from real intelligent beings now which is a slightly different thing and and i mean that and that would be interesting no. is 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 that because i to me that the bottom up top down is not quite adequate and the con top down constraints is not quite because it would have to be not just a um, a constraint, but uh, because that presupposes that there was something there that then uh, that the, that the constraint is coming from outside, and what mm -hmm. what I'm talking about is a kind of a unity that precedes, that's presupposed, um, and 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 I'm wondering how you can get that into something if if the, it's the very but, nature but, of it to be presupposed, and I and I'm not saying you can't, but I'm saying. You if you can, it's it. I, it's it seems to me that you're going to have to somehow derive it from a living thing, and so and that's weird, conceivable. The, that's conceivable, I suppose. But it, but but <laughs> but we are talking about something really frightening. We are, and that's why I keep saying it's a threshold. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and I, I mean, if you take the the sort of biological analogy seriously, the way. Or he does. Of course, it precedes the organism. It's there in the environment. It's there in the society. It's there in the his. I mean, I can roll in a, a hundred Hegelian arguments here uh, yeah. about how yeah. it does. Right about how it. Right. And, and, right. and you know, and and those don't have to be supernaturalistic. You have Brandom and right. Pinker and others saying no. This can be given a completely naturalistic explanation. And 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 I'm not here to challenge like yeah. certain things. Yeah. Uh, but what I'm saying is, um, uh, I don't have any problem acknowledging everything you just said, right? Yeah. I, yeah. And I and 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 I don't think I'm misunderstanding you. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like yeah, to... I, and I, I mean, I, I'm actually, I, I mean this sort of just an exploratory sort of way, but I, I wonder if there's a difference between the unity of an, of an organism, and this is where Hegel might not be so helpful, the difference between the, the, the givenness of the unity of an organism and the givenness of the unity of a society um, or a culture. But those aren't exactly the same thing because I, I there's there's something to, and there, there's a kind of you know relative priority of either one but there's something really distinctive about the unity of an organism that's very yeah that that um that I think is crucial to this question to, to to my mind in a way and I'm I'm not saying it can't be answered but that's the question that would have to be answered how do we actually reproduce well, that kind of or unity. Well, uh, we we know stuff that Aristotle didn't know. We, you are not an Aristotelian unity. You are a society. You literally are yeah, yeah. billions of animals, right? Uh, and so right. that's important. And that means the there might not be a difference in kind between how you are organized as a living thing and how societies are organized. Um, and people like Michael Levin are producing some really important empirical evidence indicating that's kind of the case and i'm, I'm not saying it's I'm not saying anything's conclusive yeah. but yeah. It, it needs to be taken seriously yeah 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 I, I i think that that i agree with you john i think that that uh that's the way that i try to always speak about agency and intelligence is one that tries to scale mm -hmm. almost effortlessly through the the different mm -hmm. you know to avoid the woo soul that that, mm -hmm. that you know, we're afraid of um, but then again, this is the, this is the issue. Like this is in some ways that it's the same problem, like w one way or the other. So let's say you have a group that self-organizes around a purpose, right. Or self-organizes around affiliation or some type of origin, right. That, that affiliation, that purpose is also given, right. It's like, it appears yeah. as a revelation. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we're all hunting a lion together. And now we're a group and we're moving towards, towards a purpose. Now, this is a, this is the this is the problem with the situation of what's going now is that what is it? Yeah. What angel are we catching? Mm -hmm. Like what 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 God are we trying to to manifest? Like which unity? What purpose? We have no idea. And so we're building this massive body, like this huge, the most powerful body that's ever existed, but nobody knows what it is we're trying to catch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because when if I get together with a bunch of guys to play basketball, I know what that body is. I know what that what that 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 agentic body, intelligent body is 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 moving towards. Right. Right. If I get together with my family and I celebrate our unity, it's because I know that we all come from the same parent and that there's a there's affiliation that makes our society coherent towards something. But now we have this problem, which is what like what are we doing like we're just building this giant body it's like a i, I agree I, and uh, and I, i've agreed with that from yeah the beginning. And, and, and the thing that, that that's so odd i mean typically if you think of technology as a human creation in some good positive sense it's it's it it, it has limits and it has a particular place and it has a particular meaning it has a particular purpose precisely because we create it in order to solve some kind of a problem we, we you know there's some there's some need that needs to be filled and that need has a kind of natural givenness or it or 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 it's revealed somehow that you know it's a responsive to something that we see what's so interesting neil postman made this point um about um you know when when he 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 said uh he went to a a, a car dealership and wanted to buy a car and the and the, the man was explained to him that they had now these you know automatic windows that that um that would roll down at the push of a button and he and he said he said uh his his i mean this sounds so naive but it's it's a profoundly interesting question he said well what problem does that solve and of course the problem that it solves is the problem of rolling a window down and he his response was i i never perceived that to be a problem you know, I mean, and it's it's really interesting. AI, I mean, the thing is, what problem are we creating it to solve? I mean, in a certain sense, it's a very different mindset. We're just kind of taking, we're, we just want to see what we can do and see what can be done. And and in, in a way, um, uh, the problems are something that, that we are arriving at and are surprising us rather than something that we're actually creating something with the just simple simple task of solving for us you see i mean i i think that's connected to this being 
placing ourselves in that in in the hands of an angel of some sort, or or you know, um, um, entering into a a, a a kind of an agency that's bigger than we are. I th- those are all connected. They are, uh, but um, I mean, one problem that was trying to be solved was the scientific problem of like. Strong AI was a project of explaining intelligence, uh, and that's a that's a worthy thing to do. And the fact that this technology has largely been separated. Yeah. But notice that's interesting. That's that's um, that's not a a technical pro like you explaining something. It's actually, I mean, to to use the classical distinction between theory and praxis. That's a sort of a theoretical issue rather than a practical one. But we think of this as a as a technology. I mean, it's it's a that's a curious. Thing. Well, I, uh, yeah, and I would get into things like books um, are technologies that move between the theoretical and practical. Mm-hmm. And very mm-hmm. powerful, and it's one of the greatest technologies we ever invented, and it had all kinds of unforeseen consequences yeah. and yeah. really massively disrupted society. Uh, but you know, and but I wanted to make another point, and this isn't a challenge. This is just a clarification point, right? These like. Like think about a computer. What problem does a computer solve? It doesn't solve a problem. It is meant to be a multiple problem solver. And then what we're trying to do is make a general problem solver. So what problem is it trying to solve? It's not trying to solve any problem. It's trying to enhance our abilities to solve all the problems we try to solve. So this machine's going to help us in medicine. It already is. It's going to help us, right? In, in yeah, physics, yeah. it all like that. And so that 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 that's the answer. Now, again, I, that's not a challenge. That's I'm just speaking on behalf of people yeah, that but, think about this. But it is kind of interesting. I mean, so so the the problem that it's solving is the is the the need to be able to solve any possible problem. Solving a meta problem. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. But but I mean it but it but it is kind of it, it's it's sort of it's sort of curious that precisely because of the the indeterminacy of that, um, um, we're we're uh, we're, we're we're exposing us and I'm just sort sort of stating you know uh, our our condition here in a way we're sort of exposing ourselves to a, a really great risk I, i'm just restating what everybody has been saying here today but I, um that's that's something that that you know requires yeah. some wisdom as you've been saying over and over john and 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 prayer to use jonathan's language too <laughs> i just want to do one can't you're jumping I've in mentioned in okay. the in the in the ser- in my essay which is we well, we, we have done this before uh, mm-hmm. that's how civilization emerged nobody built it to solve a problem there's a bunch of little problems and what civilization is is a meta problem solver right and that's that's what it is um and then and then you can so i've actually suggested we should also be paying attention to the 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 lifetimes and the life cycles of civilizations and how civilizations reproduce and wh- why they rise and why they fall to get some better understanding uh uh some other ways of thinking about these machines so we're the civilizations we're drawing... are huge distributed cognition collective intelligence machines yeah. that's that's yeah. the living in cities is a horrible idea except for the fact that it gives us better access to the collective intelligence of distributed cognition that's the that's the benefit that outweighs all the many noxious side effects of living in cities you can also get better coffee typically <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we're we're coming toward the end of our time here um i mean this so has been I- fantastic this is amazing. Like, I don't. Th- I rarely can go for two hours on any conversation. <laughs> like we were just, we've just been going. It's- well, not only go for two hours, but sort of wish we had another two. That's right. yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, we can, we can, we can work on doing this again because it feels like we're, we're sort of, we finally all come together around something here, and now we're really asking what feels like a really important question to me is, well, how do we think about integrating? this solution, this meta solution into our meta problems. And that's, yeah. that's a really I would, interesting I mean, question. I think that John bringing up civilization is a, such a great yeah. point, yeah. something yeah. that I would really love to explore because there is also, you know, in the kind of inscribed in the mythological stories, a relationship between transpersonal agency and civilization itself, right? Like mm-hmm. if, if you, if you want to understand why the Egyptians had their king as a god and like all this type of structure, you can help you it can help you understand how they're trying to capture, you know, higher forms of intelligence, distributed intel uh, intelligences in their society. And and the idea that we would be doing this 
technically in a in an AI, I think is something that definitely is worth thinking about and discussing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a dimension I just never struck me before. So that's that's really helpful. Is this the Enoch? Maybe maybe there's something we could read together and uh I mean short. <laughs> We're all very busy. Sure. <laughs> but but uh to prompt a, a, a another conversation well, along I, these I, lines I, of civilization. Yeah. I, I would I would recommend just because this is how uh, YouTube works that we uh, we come to decisions about that off camera. All right, yeah. okay, good call. Yeah. There you go. Right, Thank right, you. right. Um, um, I, I do. Uh, if 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 there's a call for me to hang out with you fellows again, uh, I I don't care what we're talking about. I'm in. I want to be here. I want to do it. Um, so that's all I'll say about the invitation. Same here. Um, any closing thoughts? Things that feel like need to be brought in or do we feel good about this just just a uh, word of thank you ken you were the the one who uh, yeah. Yeah. arranged this and you d did the persistent work to make it happen and find a hole in everybody's calendar that lined up not an easy thing to do so no. thank you ken yeah, thanks. and thanks for being gracious for these years now that i've known you yeah and I, in addition to thanking Ken, I want to thank you, David, and you, Jonathan. I, I always find it, I, I get to places in my thinking, the logos, that I could not possibly get on my own when I get into a living relationship with uh, both of you in conversation and in discussion. And so I appreciate it greatly. And I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah, thanks, you guys. This has been great. And I'm like, again, same. John and I have been trying to have the conversation for nine months, and we just keep like, I cancel, he cancels, then I put it <laughs> off. And, and then this is wonderful that we were able to, to finally get here. Yeah, well, thank you all. It's been a real pleasure.